um, has a Twitter handle um, that's called uh, My Sequel DBA Help, and um, it's actually spawned its own parody account called um, My Sequel Fashion Help, and I think that um, that account actually introduces him better than I ever could as a MySQL database administrator with a passion for fashion. <laughs> um, so Trent is our first speaker, um, and uh, he's actually flown in from Melbourne um, just yesterday. Um, he works at uh, REA, um, and he has seven years of Dev DevOps experience, so he's going to uh, talk to you guys about that today. Cool, yeah, so um, the organizer of um, DevOps Down Under, Matt Jones, he, he runs that parody account. Uh, it's crazy. We've got, he's one of my great mates, and actually I'm a part of his uh, wedding party, so he's going to regret that. <laughs> so. so yeah, so I want to, um, before we start, I guess I, I want to I wanna start with a, a small social experiment. Actually, before we start that, um, yeah, put your hands up. Put your hands up if you're an ops person in the room. If you, if you classify yourself as an ops person in the room. Uh, so do you see yourself as an ops person? A couple? What about a, a developer? Okay, more developers. What about someone completely different? <laughs> well, what, what do you mean as someone completely different? I do both. <laughs> Okay, all right. So I want to, um, I want to do a bit of a, a social experiment before we start. Um, so, um, so there's going to be a winner or winners. And the way that this social experiment is going to work, I want you to pick a number between 1 and 100. And I've got a prize, I've got $50 Singaporean, um, given to me by my COO, Nigel, and I'm actually not going to spend it on beer for myself, it's going to be for this. Um, so the winner or winners is going to be the person that guesses closest to two-thirds the average of the responses. So to say this again, um, pick a number between 1 and 100, and the winner will be the, cl the person closest to two-thirds the average. Um, so if you want to play along with this game, hit up uh, DOD Singapore, DevOps Days Singapore, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So, uh, I'm Trent Pottybrook. Uh, I work for REA Group, and REA Group is realestate.com.au. And realestate.com.au is a property portal similar to iProperty. Um, I started about seven years ago as a systems administrator and a DBA, and then I was uh, infrastructure lead, and now I run a couple of delivery teams. So, I've gone from really hands-on to, to hands-off. So, I want to talk a bit about um, uh, my life at REA and what we've, we've done over the last seven years and what we're really passionate about. But this is the DevOps conference. Um, so it's pretty amazing to, uh, to consider that this, this movement started in 2009 in Europe to now. Um, there's about 22 conferences a year, so that's almost one every second weekend. So that's pretty phenomenal for such a grassroots um, uh, grassroots movement. But here, um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to just try and work around the, the slides. Um, but here, um, this is the first one in Singapore, so that's fantastic. You're all a part of the first one. I remember my first DevOps days in Melbourne, and there were 70 people here. And I think here there's going to be about 100, 150 people. So it's it's fantastic the amount of, of people that are really engaged in the community here. Um, so I'm also really excited about some of the other talks here. Uh, John Wills, um, some, there's going to be a talk on Logstash. Some of the Ignites coming up are going to be fantastic. So my talk, my talk, what I'm going to be really talking about is, is REA. My talk's going to be really non-technical. It's going to be more focused on culture. Um, and I guess, I guess the, the talk is targeted at if you're a manager and you're thinking, what is this DevOps movement? What is it all about? Why should I care? I think really this may help. And also if you're an engineer and you're like, we should be doing DevOps. 
Um, I may be able to provide some some tips, some some tips uh, that you can take back to your company. So we're here at DevOps days. What is DevOps? Is it a job title? Is it AWS? Is it the EMC Dell merger that's just happened or will happen? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I've actually got a bit of a definition of what I think DevOps is, and I really want to share it with you, and, and I want you to throw stones at it. So, DevOps is Batman riding an electric unicorn. <laughs> okay, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not. I reckon DevOps, I reckon it's this, I reckon it's, it's a value stream, it's a value stream optimization, and I reckon collaborative culture is also really important in DevOps. And tools are also important, and we've got to have a common purpose. So yeah, I, I think, so right now you're probably thinking, what is Vague Stream? What is this all about? And the Batman idea was probably a, a better definition of what DevOps was. So let's unpack Vague Stream. What is it? What is Vague Stream? So Vague Stream comes from the Toyota production system. Well, maybe not. Maybe not this Toyota. Maybe, maybe Prius. Um, Toyota production system or Vague Stream map is is a way of, of mapping the stages from idea to to delivery. And a big focus on Vague Stream map is to eliminate waste. Is to find waste and eliminate it. So it's also Vague Stream is coming becoming really common when we talk about software engineering on how we model work. So if you look at the workflow of of the IT industry, there's probably these, these phases within the, the value stream. You've got coming up with an idea, you've got analysis, some sign-off, some business case and sign-off, then there's some architecture design, then some, some coding, some testing, deploy and, and to production. But I guess for, for the sake of this talk, let's just consider the, the stages between design to, uh, to production. So I remember when I when I joined RNA, we didn't do any testing at all. It was all manual observation testing. It was, it was a real mess. So we introduced tester-driven development and Jenkins as a CI. The tests would fail, and we really weren't too sure the value of this testing and, and what it was providing. And so that's testing. What about what about deployment? I worked in dev, it's an ops problem now. I remember about in 2012, I was the, uh, the guy that was deploying code to production. And our code at the time, our, our site was written in Perl. So I was given a tar artifact of, of our Perl code. And my job was to unpack that tar, tar ball uh, onto an NFS volume and then restart Apache web servers. But it would always fail, or generally fail. One of those boxes would fail, missing Perl modules. Or, or this, page alert in the middle of the night from a, a 1980s pager. So this is pretty common, right? I guess this is, this is probably some of the, the challenges that we've faced and that we've all probably seen in the past. So when, I, when I'm talking about the history map, when I'm talking about the history map, uh, there's always a, a delay between writing code to testing that code and then shipping that into production. But equally, equally, bugs, bugs occur in tests, uh, deploys fail, uh, and things fail within production. So you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking to yourself, what, what is going on? I'm, I'm like that cat in that photo there that you, you, you barely saw. <laughs> So what I really mean about value stream optimization is how can we reduce that feedback loop from a failure um, in production and then feeding that back into a, a development team? How can we uh, how can we optimize the delivery from uh, running code to it running in production and not having to wait uh, and not having having to wait a couple of couple of days to to deploy something into production? Uh, if you go back to that uh, 
um, that social experiment. Pick a number between 1 and 100, and the winner will be two thirds the average. Now, I played this experiment, I did this social experiment about a month ago with a, a group of people, and the average was about 27. So, what, do you, what did you answer? What do you think? Pick a number between 1 and 100. The average is going to be, the, the winner is going to be two thirds of the average. What would you pick? Probably uh, 66. 66? That's not going to Okay. What about you? What do you think? The instinct would be 33, but if everybody does it right, it goes down. Okay, all right. What about yourself? 50. 50. Okay. All right, well, I don't know for me, I think if the average is 50 and two thirds the average is 33, I reckon 33 that probably makes, about, makes, makes a lot of sense. But I reckon we're pretty smart, so I don't reckon everyone's going to answer above 50. Why? <laughs> Well, if everyone, if everyone thinks, hang on, uh, if the winner's going to be two-thirds the average, I'm always going to go less than 50, right? Does that make sense? But what if somebody screws up to the civilian piece of just, there's a lot of high answers. Um, <laughs> is that what you're answering right now? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> Shucky. <laughs> Are you a developer? I have to. Uh, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys, it worked on my machine before. <laughs> yeah. It was a work in development. Right? <laughs> Ox from now. How many Ox have you? I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe we need a QA or something. <laughs> this is like agile, right? Right now. The resolution's not a little bit wonky. Uh, uh, no, it's not right. <laughs> anyway, can we, can we just have that? We'll probably do it like this. So anyway, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at when, I, when I'm talking about uh, mainstream optimization, we're really trying to optimize the, the stages between um, designing something to going to production and also the feedback loop. How can we minimize the amount of pain points that are occurring from an, uh, an issue in production, uh, an issue in deployment, an issue in testing? So that's really what I'm, what, I, what I'm talking about, about the extreme optimization, just to be happy cats. So I guess for me and then for REA, a culture, a collaborative culture really feeds into that, that value stream and that value stream optimization. So how do you make a culture of collaboration? I think for, for, for me, there's three things that feed into that. There's, there's hiring the right people, uh, there's structuring the team that makes sense, and also um, and, and also uh, encouraging events that force collaboration. So hiring the right people, or um, as a few people at REA say, you know, crafting some hurdles that we force people to jump over. Um, so when we when we hire people, we're really testing two things. We're testing the culture side of things, and we're also testing the the technical capability. So thinking about technical and testing for technical, we're really testing how well you are at a stage, how well are you at coding stuff or uh, testing stuff or incident management. Whereas when, we, when we're testing for culture, we're really testing how well you uh, collaborate with, with other people, how well you collaborate between operators and developers and testers. So, for instance, if you're if you're a developer, would you be willing to take the pager? Or if you're an operations person, would you be willing to sit down with some developers and, and help architect a really scalable solution? So, for us, um, we do a couple of pre-filtering pre-filtering stages, and we also then do some some long-form interviews, and we engage a wide set of people within our interview process. 
So this is one of our pre-filtering tests um, for operations candidates. We asked them, deploy this uh, Sinatra application. Write some configuration code to deploy this Sinatra application in a language of your choosing. So Chef, Bushka, uh, Docker container, whatever. And then we re review that output. Um, the interesting bit about this for me is it's not so much whether you're able to do this, but some of the uh, some of the other factors that go into your thinking around how you do deployment, like do you consider security, for instance? And then we get you in for a coffee, and we talk about the role, and we talk about you, and we want to see if you're the fit for the role. And so assuming that um, you like us and we like you, we get you in for a long form interview, and we do to the long form interview in three phases. We do a, a break fix, technical interview, uh, and a cultural interview. So for our operations candidates, we get them, uh, we give them a box that's broken, and we say, let's troubleshoot this with, with, uh, with your pair to fix this problem. Or for a developer interview, we get you to, to refactor some code that you've already submitted to us. I actually love this phase because I love turning up the heat on the break fix scenario, it's quite fun. Um, then we get you to architect up a um, architect up a solution that you worked on in, in the past, and then we talk to you again about uh, what you want to do, what you're passionate about, and whether you're a right fit. So this, all in all, this is our, our process for hiring people. I think that the thing that I love the most is that we do a break fix uh, or a pairing interview, and it's actually not a technical interview; it's a cultural interview. For the break fix specifically, we're not really testing how well you can solve that problem, but how well you can communicate with your, your pair about what you're, what you're seeing, what you're trying. And all in all, we, we involve your entire team within the interview process so that you get to, you get to um, interview us whilst we're interviewing you. And we get some shared ownership around hiring you. I think looking at a Looking at the way people hire the tech staff in Melbourne, I think they're really focused on setting these really high technical hurdles that jump over. Whereas I don't really think that's necessary. I don't really think you should be focusing so much on the technical side of things, particularly if, uh, if that's not really where the problem is in the organisation. Because when, when you're hiring for, when you're focusing on technical, you're focusing on, on how good are you at coding or operations when in fact, maybe the bigger problem within the organization is how you communicate with one another. Testing that culture, testing that collaboration. So, so maybe the best technical candidate is not the best candidate. So we talked about uh, this. So, and a couple of you guys were saying 66, or but you're saying less than 33 as an answer for uh, picking a number between 1 and 100. So why don't we do this, why don't we do this again? Um, so I've got another $50. Um, so after, after this talk, I'll find out who won, uh, and I'll, I'll write it up on one of the open space boards. Um, so if you go to DevOps Day Singapore 2, um, let's play this again. Okay, so pick a number between 1 and 100. Uh, the winner will be the closest to two thirds of the average. So, so I was talking a little bit about how RE hires. Um, there's two other things that feed into the collaborative culture that we have. It's firstly is structuring our teams, and, and secondly is some of the events that we do to force that collaboration. So in terms of structuring our teams. Uh, when I joined REA, we used to have our bikey developers, and that was probably one of our tech leads. And then we had our tribal operations people. And then don't get me started on, on our product people up in their ivory towers. It's crazy. So over the last seven years, we've really uh, changed the way that we structured from solo-based teams and functions to really cross-functional teams. Um, and we've also integrated our product development within a, within a squad. And we've really pushed the uh, responsibility and accountability to the call face. So we have pizza box sized teams, which is about eight people. And we have three types of teams. We've got a delivery focused team that's focused on 
On what you see when you go to realestate.com.au, the product type stuff. We have a tooling focused team that's focused on uh, turning the dollar on efficiency of development and operations and an infrastructure focused team that's focused on bare metal right up to tooling or, or delivery. Uh, Javier Tarango uh, has done a few talks on how we've, we've migrated the way that we operate into the, this, this model. Um, so if you're interested, I can talk about this at, a, at an open space. Maybe this is a good open space idea, or, or searching for Javier Tarongo would also be a cool thing if you're interested in this. So this is really how our teams look right now. Or, uh, or maybe it's this, but I'm actually not sure who the product person would be, with it, whether they'll be spinning or, or being really spin. So I don't know. But I think we're, um, some of the challenges that we have is, how do we manage BAU? How do we manage Shellshock? How do we manage a LibSSL bug? With, the, with our delivery focus. So this is probably a good open space to talk about sometime today or tomorrow. Um, so if I go back, go back in time at REA, back in 2011, we couldn't hire, we had trouble hiring. We were quite successful financially and we wanted to scale up, but we couldn't hire anyone in Melbourne. <coughs> uh, we exhausted all of the talent pool in Melbourne. So what do you do when you can't hire? Well, for us, we went to China. Um, we tried some um, outsourcing in the past, back in 2007, and it didn't really, really work. So we wanted to try something different. We wanted to try distributed Agile. And we partnered with ThoughtWorks to, to do distributed Agile between Melbourne and Australia. So we have pizza box sized teams in Melbourne and, and some in Xi'an, China. So within those distributed teams, there's really two focuses, or two types of structures. There's, there's one that's, that's delivery focused in, in Xi'an, um, and then the other is a mix of Melbourne and Australian people within the team. So you have half the slices in Melbourne, half the slices in, in Xi'an, or, or most, most of the slices in Xi'an, China. We have all of our product development and, and our product thinking in Melbourne, so that's really where that, that final slice is. Um, so, over the last last month, I'm becoming, I, I uh, was doing a little bit of research on, in collaborative culture, and I came across Hofstede. I don't know if you've heard of Hofstede, but Hofstede was famous in the 90s, and he worked for IBM, and he was famous for conducting surveys with all of the staff at IBM across the world. Uh, and he collected that data back, and then he, he saw some, some really strange relationships between countries, various different countries. And he's used that data to form, uh, to, to try and articulate the differences between cultures within countries. So for instance here, uh, comparing China and Australia where, where we do our delivery, um, there's a massive difference between uh, power distance and individualism. So by power distance, uh, for Australia, which is quite low, that really means we, we want to be able to talk to the CEO and say, hey, uh, this is what I'm doing, what are you doing? Whereas in China, that has such a high power distance, they don't really want to talk to, the, to these executive people. They're really distant from those executive people. The other thing that I found really interesting about this was the individualism. So individualism for Australia is, is quite high, meaning that we want to be a part of something. And we want to be part of a great company. Whereas China, they, they don't really care about, they don't really care about the company per se, but they really care about their family. They really care about their close-knit set of relationships. So these two things were really interesting for me. Um, and so I, I run one of the uh, Xi'an-based delivery teams. And uh, I was thinking about how uh, I've been really happy with how I run my team. And my team is really successful. And I think overlaying Hofstede, I think what I really wanted when I started that team was to create a really family feel. I wanted to have really common, strong connections with the people of my team within Xi'an. And so the way that I do that is two things. Firstly, I do a word exchange with my team. And I do a show and tell. So every day we do a word exchange. So 
I think this occurred about two days ago, there was, we were teaching them what oxymoron was, and I can't remember what this is. Um, I'm actually really bad at Mandarin. The second thing that we do is a show and tell, uh, where we spend about an hour every fortnight, and we just talk about stuff that's not work-related, or we do something practical that's not work-related. So here right now, we're, uh, we're baking a cake, and we're baking a cake over Skype. So that was pretty cool. So, so Mung in the middle, um, she talked about colours, because she loves colours. Lou on the right, she's obsessed with Kobe Bryant, and she talked about NBA. Uh, Jesse on, on the left here, um, he's obsessed with Ingress. I don't know why I, I don't like the game. Sorry for Ingress people. Um, I talked about my love of Darren Brown, and um, I taught my team dating advice. Uh, trying to teach Chinese people dating advice was, was crazy. Um, so I guess to, what, what I take away from working with my Xi'an team is that guys in Xi'an are strange. Guys in different countries are strange. Maybe, maybe I'm strange. Um, but maybe if you, if you do work with diff, uh, people from a different country, or you, you have outsourcing, or you do distributed agile like REA, Maybe using Hofstede as a, as a starting point to understand the different cultures, to, to see how you can motivate your people within, the, within your team, within different countries. So I guess lastly, the, the things that we really do to force collaboration are uh, things like hack days, where we, we task you to come up with a product idea, uh, spend two days hacking it up, and then we showcase it via a, a, a science fair. Um, this is a great tool to, to collaborate with people within your organization that you may not, may not know. And you, so you build relationships within your organization. That's really successful for us. Another thing that we do is uh, Guilds and Six, which are self-managed organizations focused around the craftsmanship. So, Given that we have pizza box sized teams that are really cross-functional, we wanted a way to, to turn the dial on that craftsmanship. If, you're, if you love Ruby, how do you, how do you get mentoring about what's uh, ways to, to write really awesome Ruby code? Or as a practical example, um, last, week, uh, last week the Cloud Guild talked about the cool stuff that came out of reInvent. Um, so again, what is DevOps? I reckon common tools are a part of this. Tools, tools are a big, big part, big part of, of DevOps, and I think it's more around. We, we use these tools to collaborate with one another, to, to talk the same net, to talk the same language. So these are the tools that we use: uh, Docker, AWS, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, tools. We've got, a, we've got all the tools. We've got all the tools. We've got like everything. Um, a great thing about REA is that we really focus on the autonomy as opposed to standardization. So what that, that means for us is that we have so much duplication. I was talking to one of the thought workers here earlier and he was reminding me that we use, um, gosh, uh, I can't remember the answer for, no. Uh, anyway, so we have all the tools. So maybe that's a great open space idea. How do you manage? Uh, standardization versus autonomy. How do you, if there's a new tool like Docker, how do you migrate your existing uh, infrastructure onto Docker? Maybe that's a good lightning talk. Sorry, maybe that's a good open space to talk about. So, DevOps. I think lastly, purpose is key. Uh, common purpose is key. And when I think of purpose, I'm reminded of Andrew Kleshaffer's uh, talk at DevOps down under a couple of years back. Little idea. And he talked about the free stone cutters. Um, so with the free, free uh, stone cutters, uh, a person on the street, he sees free stone cutters. And he goes up to the first stone cutter. And he says, what do you do? And that person responds, uh, I, I cut stone. He goes up to the second person. What do you do? Uh, I, I cut stone. Let me show you how I do it. 
And he goes up to the third person. What do you do? And the third person pauses. And he says, I build cathedrals. So purpose is a fantastic motivator to rally something, rally your, your people around something. Uh, for me, in my area at REA, I work for the mobile apps and personalization tribe. And our purpose is to build the best property app. And I want to be a part of that. I want to build the best property app. So that's, for me, that's a massive motivator. So, I guess lastly, going back to, going back to the, the, the test. Do you think, uh, so, what did you answer the first time? Uh, 53 the first time. What about the second time? 29. Okay. What about yourself? I picked 20. And second time? No, I didn't pick the first time. Okay. Uh, what about you? Uh, I didn't vote, but I would have picked, uh, I think, something like 30 the first time and then lower the second time, maybe something like 2 or 3. Okay. What do you, what do you, why would you pick lower? Because I think everybody is going to lower their uh, numbers when they understand the experiment better. Yeah. Okay. Is that pretty, pretty, pretty common? Okay. I guess, I guess by that experiment, what I'm trying to articulate is that when you have that common purpose, um, it's it's really critical to be heading in that same direction. And this experiment highlights that. If we all know what, what everyone in the room is going to vote, we're going to vote lower. And that's a really a, a good data point to show that we're, we're getting common purpose. And we're heading in that same direction. So lastly, what is DevOps? I reckon value stream. I reckon it's a value stream optimization. I reckon uh, collaborative culture is key. I reckon common purpose is really important. And also overlaying tools uh, in the mix is, is foundation to what DevOps is. Or maybe it's just Batman riding an electric unicorn. So lastly, I guess, um, some open space ideas. Like, how do you manage BAU and delivery work? How do you keep the tools up to date? How do you do distributed development when you're, if you've got multiple countries in, in, involved? Who, who goes on pager? Maybe these are some good, good open space ideas for later today. Um, that's it. Thanks. Happy kittens.